Thanks again for buying a flare. What this class is designed for is, I'd say kind of a low level basics because there are a lot of people that this will be their first machine, partly because of the price point, partly because of COVID. Uh, this might be the first time you're brewing with an espresso machine of any kind. And so we wanna make sure you have some of the basics and fundamentals, but you could also have quite a lot of experience with uh, espresso machines. We, we have a lot of baristas and I think we have a competitor here. I didn't check to see if Doug's in the room today, but uh, we have competitors too. People that know their way around an espresso machine, but manual brewing is a little bit different. Um, you have so much control here, which is great, but it also means that you've gotta be on your game because the machine's not going to do the work for you. You have to do the work. And for that reason, manual brewing can be a little bit different than you know, with, a, with a pump machine, that sort of thing. Also, if you love coffee and you've been brewing it forever, say on a filter, French press, Turkish, uh, air press, it's going to be a little bit different still. There's things you need to, to be aware of. So that's what this is meant to be. And I'll try to give you a chance in the Q&A session later to ask me some questions I might not have covered. But the focus again is going to be introducing you to manual brewing with the flare. Also, the other thing I wanted to see real quick, what do we have for the polls? Uh, we want to know what you're brewing with. So seven of you have the pro, four of you have the signature. That's been typical for us. We have a lot of, oh, I need to get somebody else in here. Sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, so a lot of you are buying the pro that are taking these classes. And for that reason, we've chosen to just brew with the pro. But I want to let you know that brewing with the pro is not going to be a whole lot different than brewing with the classic or a signature. The, the main difference between, say, the signature and the pro is uh, the, the size of the portafilter, uh, the, the brew basket and the cylinder. So you're gonna be able to use a little bit more water, a little bit more coffee, longer shots, that sort of thing, but you're gonna have a gauge in both. And if you have the classic, which I didn't see anybody did have one today, you wouldn't have the gauge. You'd have to sort of uh, use the forest Luke or something like that, or use a, uh, you can always use a scale, um, but you don't need to because you have the gauge, but you could always use a scale, put your flare on there, pull that, and there's a, there's a formula for how much pounds of, force you're applying to the lever and what's that's going to be doing for brew pressure. Uh, but if you have those questions, we can talk about that later. Let me just make sure we got everybody in. And um, once again, please make sure you get your muted, uh, your mic's muted so that we can keep the focus on me and get a nice clean audio. All right. So uh, again, I want to brew with the pro today. I'm going to go through how I brew, and this is just what I do. You don't have to do it my way. I'm just wanting to give you some basics in case it's completely new to you uh, or you're struggling a little bit. You want to try something different. So I'm going to run through how I do it. And then, of course, you can modify that as you need or ignore it all. It's up to you. Um, I've been brewing quite a bit for the last three years, so I'm pretty familiar with the product and how to get the most out of it. So that's kind of what I want to share with you today. So back to manual brewing. Again, if you have experience with making espresso with other machines, remember we don't have a way to continually heat the, uh, the brew head. So we've got to come in with as much energy, as much heat as we can, and roll with that and go as fast as we can and not you know, futz around with things. Because as you're doing that, the temperature on your cylinder and your portafilter are dropping. Um, and a few degrees can make a difference. Uh, so what we like to do is suggest, now if you have the Pro, you have a preheat cap. And I'm here to tell you, don't use it ever. Well, use it and I'll show you how later, but not, not to preheat. Because you can put the cap on there and pour water in there, but the first pour is not going to get this up to the same temperature of your water. Neither will the second, maybe the third, depends on what you can boil at. I'm boiling at 93 degrees here, not 100. Uh, so I'm even limited there. So you're going to want to find a better way to preheat this. So that's good news for the cylinders uh, from a standard like the Signature or the Classic, which we are making one, but we don't have one yet. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that because most of us don't use this anyways. What we do use is uh, various ways to heat it up. So like if you're using a kettle, and I do recommend a gooseneck kettle, you have little vents here. Depending on what your kettle looks like and that sort of thing, you could probably prop that right over that and let the vents of the steam uh, heat up your brew head. So while you're boiling water for brewing, you could be steaming this. There's other solutions, and that is, this is a silicone. It's a little uh, soft silicone. It's safe to use, FDA approved uh, for food and, and that sort of thing, contact, and well within the temperatures we're using. You can get a funnel that fits your kettle, clip off the bottom, and then stick the cylinder in there. So again, while I'm heating up my water, I'm heating up that and it's getting ready for me. And I know that I'm gonna come in with as much energy as I can and as close to the actual target temperature as I want to. 
In the meantime, I just recommend go ahead and boil wherever you're at. Just boil that water from your kettle, uh, from a pot, from whatever. You can always catch the temperature on the way in, but it's really hard if you're only just heating it to the temperature you want to use and then trying to move it into to position to pull the shot. So go ahead and get it hotter than you want. Catch it on the way down. Also, if you're going to do the steam method like I'm suggesting here, you have to boil the water, right, to get that steam. So while that's going there, I'm going to go ahead and prep, uh, get my coffee ready. So today I'm going to use a little giant and I'm going to use 16 grams. So we weigh everything here. We weigh what goes into the basket and what comes out. It's always the best way to get the best results because you're going to be able to uh, repeat the results, right? So if you have a really good taste of espresso and you want to get that for the next time, if you didn't know how many grams you put in there uh, or how many grams you pulled out, you're going to have different flavors, different tastes, different pressure in the system. It's all going to affect that. So if you don't already have one, get a scale. We'll talk about that in a minute. And I'm going to again put in about 17, uh, 16 grams. And I'm also going to brew with a brew ratio. And brew ratio basically just means I'm, uh, if you're familiar with coffee from other ways, then you'll know that it, there's a percentage of dry coffee to uh, wet coffee or the yield. So my brew ratios for espresso tend to be about one to two, um, or you could call it two to one, whichever you want to say, whichever direction. But basically, if I have 16 grams in, I'm going to typically pull about 32 out. That's a two to one. So that's good to go there. And uh, again, keeping track of the grams going in and the grams coming out is going to give you uh, better, better repeatability and good results. So I've got a flare grinder, flare royal, and I'm going to cheat here. We put it into a, this isn't necessarily available for sale, uh, but it's just something I've done for modification to help me in these classes. So while that's uh, grinding over there, I want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, when it comes to prepping your basket, it's more about getting the coffee even and level before you tamp it. It's less about how much force, only that that same force, that same uh, applied force that you put to your tamp is going to be repeated every time because if I tamp really hard this time and really light the next time, it is going to affect the way that the extractions are. Uh, generally speaking though, we say press until you feel the coffee pressing back on you and that means that you've compressed all the pockets, uh, you've probably got out you know, any issues you might have had with density. You just want to make sure you have a nice firm press and then try to track that from one to the other uh, shots here. Tap that out. So you can see I'm kind of tapping this a little bit and the, the goal here is to make sure that I get all the coffee that went in out and sometimes it clings depending on static charge and that sort of thing. Um, You'll be surprised, but your, your grinders can withhold, hold back one to two grams of coffee, which is pretty significant when it comes to extraction. So do make sure that you are getting all the coffee back out. And then also uh, consider that when you're making adjustments later to dial in your grind, you're probably holding back a gram or two of the last grind. So even though you clicked and made a different change there, you're probably still using some of that old coffee. So if you're really trying to dial in, you're going to want to purge a gram or two of the last adjustment before you work on the next one. All right, so you could weigh this as well, uh, but because usually speaking with a hand grinder, it's, it's fairly good at not retaining, so I'm not gonna worry about it too much here, um, as long as I'm weighing on the way in. Some grinders though do hold about two grams or more, and so you do wanna weigh what you're using after you've ground it to make sure you're getting that. Um, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm going to switch here to a top-down view. All right, so should be able to see more of what I'm doing here. Um, now, when it comes to, I tell people when it comes to distributor tools and things of that nature, I would say keep it simple. The only thing I like about this is no matter how good your grinder is, you can always still see that as you put it into your basket, it can tend to have like compression, compression waves or it can pile up to one side or the other. So something like this, this is a Weiss distribution technique that we're about to use. Uh, very gentle needles like this just helps me to make sure that even though I have a good grind that I'm distributing it well in the uh, in the bed. So I wanted to make sure I did that first. There's another alternative to that. If you don't have it, you can kind of shake it sideways up and down like this. You're just again making sure that you're getting the coffee to settle into that basket uh, nice and level. I also like to give a nice straight tap like this just to compress it a little bit more before I actually go to tamp it. And when I go to tamp it, I'm focused on a nice vertical tamp and I'm not worried about, again, 
overdoing it. The amount of force I can generate with my fingers and my hands is far below what we're about to hit it with on the uh, lever there. So really there's a point where you're not gonna do much more than just compress the ground. So that's what I did. In this way I like to do it with my fingers because I can manage this and make sure it's not off to the side. Um, so I, I recommend tamping this way. When you tamp like this, you can't really see what's going on under there. You can't tell if you're off angle, that sort of thing. So you can see I have a nice, uh, I don't know if that's going to focus for us here, but uh, anyways, you can see I have a nice level tamp there. And if you have the Pro, you have a screen that looks a little different on one side or the other. On the Signatures Classics, it's the same uh, as far as like you can only put it in one direction, so it's not a, not a question that anybody asks, but people with Pros always ask up or down, which holes. It doesn't really matter, just make sure you get it in there uh, nice and flat. So what I like to do is I slide it over the top like this until it drops right in and that usually works well for me because if you get that sort of cattywampus uh, before you go to, uh, oops, looks like my kettle shut down on me for a minute. So we got to give that a second to catch up. Uh, but just making sure that you have that level because if this is off in there then it's going to allow water to pass through more than one or the other. You can see I have a scale down here, I'm going to turn that on. So again, we weigh all the stuff that goes in and all the stuff that comes out. I'm brewing, again, um, I'm actually gonna try to make a latte, so I'm gonna pull it a little bit shorter than one to two. But uh, if I was doing one to two, again, I'm gonna look for 30, 36 gram, uh, 32 grams here, and about 30 to 35 seconds, depending uh, what I'm doing here. So I like to do that because you'll find if you stop a shot somewhere in the middle, say 36 grams, 32 grams one time, but then the next time you go and you pull that to 50, uh, 50 or 54 grams out, that, those two shots of espresso with the same coffee, the same amount of coffee, everything else is, are going to taste quite a bit different. So keeping track of what's going in, what's going out is going to help. I'm going to fill this all the way in. If you have a signature, uh, it's the same thing. You've got a plunger here. I want to make sure the water gets all the way in. We can tell you a little bit more about that later. I don't want to leave air in the system, so if you want to brew volumetrically, I can explain how to do that later. But always make sure that you're filling it into the well. All right, and let's see. I'm gonna get you a view of my portafilter. All right, so the idea here, right, is I've got a view of my basket. I can tell if I have extraction issues if I'm watching the bottom of my basket. So I'm going to use a, a, a mirror all the time as well. Now I'm going to start my shot by slowly pressing down on the lever and putting just about one to two bars in this is a pre-infusion, and I'm going to hold it there. See, I have a little bit of coffee coming through the basket there. And now I'm going to push into that, and I'm going to go for about seven bars. And I'm just going to hold that there. And I can just put, you can't tell, but I just threw an arm over that, and it's kind of an arm bar. I'm just holding that, leaning into this. I'm not working out on this, not too hard. And I'm just going to watch my scale, and I am going to stop the shot, as I said, at around 26, 28 today so that I can try to do a latte in a minute. And just keep going, and as I get closer to my weight, I'm going to slowly back off of that lever just a little bit, rather than releasing it too fast and too hard. All right, so the only time I use my cap is right now. I put it under there just to catch drips. That's all I do. I'm not sure if this is going to uh, focus here for you, but you can see, pretty nice looking shot there. And I'm going to switch back the view here for a second. To there. All right. Hi. Back. Uh, so at this point, if I'm just going to drink it as espresso, I'm going to transfer it out. The reason I do transfer out and not drink out of the cup that I put it into is usually the espresso comes in a little denser, a little heavier at the beginning and a little lighter at the end. So it can be fairly stratified as I start to drink it. It's going to taste a little bit different. Um, as I get down further in. So I want to make sure that I either stir it with a spoon or I transfer it out into something else to kind of get some turbulence and, and get everything moved around. But I am going to try, like I said, a latte today. I wanted to show you a trick um, for how to make a latte with a machine that doesn't have a steam wand. Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. French press is one. And uh, I've had varying success with a, with a French press. I'm not all that good at it. Uh, but there's a cool little tool now on the market. Well, it's on Kickstarter, and it is a, uh, it's a wand, but it's different than all the other ones, the way that it's got a propeller and a mesh screen that helps to give you micro bubbles. And basically, it's called the Nanofoamer. Um, again, it's Kickstarter right now for about another 20 days or so. 
I backed it. And if you like lattes and cappuccinos, I recommend you back it as well. And it's uh, really cool because all you have to do is heat the milk up and they have a kettle, or I'm sorry, a jug here that allows you with a nice safe hold, even when this is on say a heat source. So you can have this on electric stove or induction or even a gas if you had like a diffuser. And you can heat the milk right from here. I have a little temperature strip tells me about where I'm getting at because I want to try to keep that in the range of 55 degrees. Um, so let me go ahead and put that here. I'm going to move this out of the way. And I am not a latte artist, but I am going to try my best uh, to show you a little bit how to do this. And of course, it's uh, I'm still getting used to this product, but it does pretty good results. All right, so I'm going to stick this in. And you're supposed to get it in the middle there for a few seconds, make a whirlpool, get some bubbles going. And then you're supposed to move it off to the side a little bit, but keep the whirlpool going to keep the bubbles through. And then just sort of watch it and uh, hope that you're getting a pretty good texture, not too much. And stop when it looks about good. So that looks not terrible. Um, may or may not be able to do real fancy stuff with it. Well, I'm not that good anyway, so it won't be that fancy. I'm going to tamp it on the counter. And we'll see how we go. Like I said, this is not my strong suit. But I wanted to give you guys some examples uh, because not everybody drinks it as an espresso. Ah, it got a little cattywamp. This didn't work out so well, but um, you can see that it can do the, uh, do the job and give you guys something to play with and something to have fun with if you wanted to have, like I said, a cappuccino or a latte, you can make that, sorry, you can make that latte, uh, you can make that latte which, trying to pour, you need to have smaller, uh, smaller bubbles, but if you want to make a cappuccino, you can go big on the bubbles and, and kind of separate a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna take a sip for that, wet my whistle. That was good. Uh, I wanted to talk to you now about how to deal with your brew head. So, a couple thoughts. If you're making espresso for somebody else in the house, then you're going to need to quickly go from one shot to the next. So in that case, I definitely don't want to cool this down under cold water. I want to keep the heat and the, um, and the thermal energy inside it. So there's a couple ways to do that. First off, you need to, if you do brew to wait like I did, you're gonna still have water in the system. You need to get rid of that. Um, also, when you go to remove this, push up as you pull out because sometimes you can separate these two pieces. The only thing holding them together is a little O-ring and friction, but mainly it's that active lever on that. So with this being heavy, wet coffee in there, it's twice the weight now of the coffee I put in there, and water in there, it, it can cause this part to pull away. So make sure you're pushing up as you pull out to keep those together, and then make sure you drain the rest of the water that's in there in the system. There'll always be a little bit of water still in there, it never all, always comes out, so let me just go ahead and keep that around while I do that. Uh, and then just sort of twist that apart, and make sure you get the rest of it out. Now, Again, if I'm making espresso for another person and I don't have another basket on hand, then I wanna go ahead and keep this ready to go hot. Um, depending on your sensitivity to temperature, you can kind of reach in there, push that, get that out of the way, and then knock this over a trash can or something. And really at this point, all I wanna do is make sure it's clean and dry, and I'm not gonna really worry about um, running this under cold water. Again, I wanna keep that energy that I have, that heat. Just make sure I get the old stuff out, make sure it's, uh, dry and not going to be moist because if I put some dry coffee in there now and it's moist, it's going to cling and catch and, and cause some extraction issues. So this is ready to go. If I already had the coffee ground, I dump it in. Now I also have this plunger. You can see it's down a little bit lower. I want to make sure I get it to the top. So that is another good use for your, this is a plastic tamper dosing cup and it helps you to reset your plunger to the top without having to touch it and getting hot. So this would be ready to go. I could pull another shot pretty quickly, uh, depending on how, how I had everything else set up. I might not need to preheat this. I might just be able to keep rolling with it and uh, go from there. Let's see. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, uh, and it's good I see some stuff coming to chat and we'll get to that in a little bit. Just wanna let you know I'm not ignoring you, but I want to get through kind of the demo, demo stage and then we'll go back in and, and see what kind of questions you have, anything I didn't cover well. Um, oh, there was somebody in the waiting room, so sorry if you just joined us. Uh, 
we, we had to get on with the class. But anyways, there'll be a recording. So if you just joined us, joined us late, I'll have a recording link for you. You can catch the part that you missed. A um, couple things I wanted to talk about, uh, more of like the best practices. And, uh, oops, what happened there? Let me get myself back. Spotlight. Oops. I am not good at this, sorry. I think I'm spotlighted here. Um, I want to make sure that you always fill up. We talked earlier, if you want to brew volumetrically, and volumetrically, if you ever see somebody with the brew head here on a scale and they're adding water to it and they stop pouring it in at a certain point, they're basically doing that so that they can pull that lever all the way to the end, not stop it short like I did, and get roughly what they were targeting for a yield. Usually dry coffee will hold about one to 1.2 grams of water for every gram of coffee. So if I started, say, with 70 grams of water and I put it through 20 grams of coffee, my shot's not gonna be any bigger than 50 grams. It's probably a little bit less. So you can use that simple math and calculation and practice with your coffee to sort of know how much water to put in to be able to pull that lever all the way to the end and get about what you want in the cup. The problem is we don't wanna leave air in the system, so if I were to leave the plunger at the top and then underfill this system, it's going to behave odd. It's not gonna behave well, it's gonna possibly cause this to separate on you. And the reason being is water's very compress air is very compressible, water's not. So as I start to lower the lever with air in the system, a lot of it, that air has to compress before I can start to push the column of water into the coffee. So after the shot, when I let go, that air is going to go back in this direction you know, pretty fast, violently, rapidly, and it causes these two things to, to separate. Also, you'll notice if you have air in the system and you start to lower that lever, you won't see that needle moving anywhere for a while until you've compressed the air all the way. So definitely don't use any air. The, the trick here is to just lower that plunger a little bit more and when you lower the plunger a little bit more before you pour in the water, that's just reduced the overall capacity of the brew head. With some trial and error, you'll be able to figure out roughly how many millimeters, how many inches to lower that plunger so you can fill it effectively full of water and still pull that shot all the way to the end. So if you want to brew that way. But again, always make sure we're filling to the top, um, into there, and it's okay if you pop in the plunger or the stem while there's still some water. It just kind of displaces out of the way. It's not a big deal. Uh, you heard me say that when you go to finish the shot, don't just let go too fast. If you let go too fast, you've got a pressurized system. If that needle hasn't gotten close enough to zero, it could cause it to also expand and pop off on you, and any kind of water that's still in there is going to bounce out as well. So just make sure that you're slowly ramping into pressure and out. Um, it's just easier that way. If you have uh, a frequently asked question we have is, my system's losing pressure, uh, something's wrong, uh, it was great yesterday or the last week and now it's not. If you don't see water coming from somewhere, clear water from maybe uh, the side of the gauge or any, anywhere else we have an O-ring. If you don't see clear water, it's not a leak. It's not a pressure loss. Pressure loss will manifest itself in a leak that you will see. If it's leaking through the bottom of your basket fast, that's, that's you know, performing well. That's just the fact that you need to grind a little bit finer for that coffee. Uh, people don't always know that when you change coffees or even as your coffee ages, the extraction is going to look different. The pressure is going to be built up differently based on the grind. If you don't change the grind as you use that coffee for 30 days or if you swap in new coffee and you don't change the grind dial in, it's going to result in a, in a different, um, either more pressure or less pressure. So do make sure that you're always sort of dialing in your grinder, um, even for the same coffee. So again, if it's not a pressure loss if you don't see water leaking out. Do keep in mind that this gauge needs to be, let me get it out where I can reach it. This gauge needs to be snugged up, finger tight, and then backed out just as much as you need to view it. If I were to continue to back it out a full another turn or so, I might have a leak right here. Um, that O-ring needs to be seated. So if you do have a leak right here, just tighten that down all the way. And then if it's still leaking, then we probably need to get you a new O-ring. There might've been some damage there. Um, I think that's mainly it. The only other thing I want to mention, uh, and we'll talk about this in best practices, is that if everything's right timing-wise and all the rest, and you're, you're, you're getting what you perceive as a sourness, uh, overly sourness flavor, it's probably that you're not getting your cylinder up to temperature enough, um, or maybe your shots are running too fast. So I'd like to make that, the point that if you haven't had that coffee, as an espresso. You could, you could brew it any other way and it could taste great and you love it that way. But if you haven't already had that 
as espresso. It could just be that coffee doesn't um, work well for you and your taste buds in the espresso method. So make sure that wherever you buy that coffee, if you have that chance to go to the roaster or the cafe, that you've had them pull a shot on their machine that's all dialed in to make sure you actually enjoy it. Because if you don't enjoy it dialed in on their machine, you're definitely not gonna uh, have any better results with the flare. It's just going to be a matter of finding the coffees that work well for you. So sour and acidity, they're, they're one and the same, but also very different. So a lot of times people just say, oh, it's sour, 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 but really it's just a lot of acidity um, and, and more you know, intense than they're looking for as an espresso. It's definitely not a classic uh, Italian uh, taste. So I'll walk through that. And now I wanted to talk a little bit more about theory, uh, just general basics. I'm gonna drink a little bit more. If you're a photographer, I like to try to find a way to relate, you know, if this is new to you, extraction, coffee, that sort of thing. Uh, if you're a photographer, you might be familiar with the term, the exposure uh, triangle. And basically, I would call this the extraction triangle. And that is, there's three main things, there's a lot of little things, but there's three main things that are going to affect the taste and the flavors of your coffee and the results. And you can tweak one or the other of these three things a little bit, there's a window you can play with um, to more or less get the same flavors in the cup, the same body, the same feel. So that's temperature, time, and pressure. So if you're, for instance, starting with a temperature that's a little bit lower than the last time, you can compensate with a little bit more time or a little bit more pressure to try to get more or less the same flavors in the cup. So if you're handicapped like me at 93 degrees, I'm in the mountains, by the way, in Golden, Colorado. If you're handicapped like me and you're really coming in at the very lowest end, like 93 degrees, 197 Fahrenheit, 193 Celsius is about the lowest that they recommend for, say, a medium roast um, of espresso. So I have to bring in as much energy as I can and I have to find little ways to, to go after, say, a light roast. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging to extract up here. Um, so I do have to play with pressure and time a little bit more differently. It's also important to note that when, if you're, if you're used to brewing espresso or, um, sorry, filter coffee, and you know that those, those shots, um, not shots, <laughs> mixing my terms, but those extractions can go three to four minutes. Uh, generally speaking, you're not using pressure and the grind is a lot coarser, so it's going to need more time. So in that same mind frame, think about espresso is typically 30 seconds, 33 seconds when you read about it online and uh, and the pressure is nine bar roughly, but you don't have to play by those rules and you'll find that it actually works best when you don't because a couple things. One, espresso is anywhere between five bars and 10 bars, generally speaking. You go any more and you start to cause issues. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hit more than 10 bars. You can compress the puck so much that you're not gonna get water through the puck anymore. It's just gonna channel around, go around the sides of that. I like to brew a lot of my shots, you might have seen closer to seven bars. Um, when you come in with a little bit low pressure, you have less problems with uh, extraction issues like channeling, that sort of thing. Uh, but espresso can be anywhere, like I said, anywhere between five and 10. So experiment, play around. Also time, our grind is a little bit coarser than say a commercial basket. So if you go into a cafe, you'll see that their baskets are a little bit wider and therefore a little bit shallower. That means that same 16 grams of coffee that I put in here is going to be a lot taller than in the uh, the wider baskets of the commercial machines. And so that's going to change the amount of resistance that the coffee bed's able to create, which means I, I can't grind as fine as it would have worked in the 58 basket. I have to grind a little bit coarser to make sure that I can push water through at eight to nine bar. And that means that I will probably want to extend my time a little bit. So if you go into the forums, uh, the Brew with Flare group that we're gonna share with you in a minute here, or online Reddit or that sort of thing, you'll find that most often people are recommending a little bit longer shot times than you see uh, traditionally uh, mentioned. And the, the reality is that most people that have a, a machine at home don't brew with a 58 millimeter basket, they brew with something like a 54 or a 52 or 49. So whether they know it or not, they sh they're probably also going a little bit longer or they should if they aren't. So uh, just keep that in mind too. Don't be surprised if you're not getting a good shot at 22, 25 seconds, 27 seconds, or even 30, 31, you might wanna run that out to 35, 40, 45 seconds, and it's probably still gonna taste great. In fact, I almost guarantee it will. Um, there's other things you can do, like you saw I did a little slow ramp and I, a little bit of a pre-infusion, and a pre-infusion is basically where you saturate the coffee bed with water and give it a few seconds before you actually come in with full pressure. And the idea there is if I saturate that coffee bed 
It should hold together better when I hit it with more pressure. It expands a little bit in that time. It, it sort of works together with all the particles uh, in unison as opposed to, you know, everybody's just sort of like holding their line. So a few seconds of pre-infusion is good. Too many seconds of pre-infusion means you're losing temperature. So keep in mind, if you see people say, oh, I do a pre-infusion for 20 seconds or 25 seconds or whatever that is, all that time your temperature is dropping. So you'll have to come in with more temperature at the beginning in order to actually brew where you want to be. Uh, so pre-infusion, low pressure, these are all good things to try as well. Longer times, um, let me see what else I'm missing. Water is really crucial and a lot of people don't realize this, is, is that the water that you're using might taste great, but it may not be um, a positive thing for the coffee itself. What's in your water will affect your extraction. Uh, it could be that maybe there's too much material in the water to allow it to dissolve or um, bring in some of the coffee material. It could be that uh, certain parts of that water are acting like buffers. So if you're looking for the, the brighter notes and the acidity, you might not be getting it if you have a lot of uh, bicarbonate and such in the water. So it's, it's hard to say, but again, back to that whole thing, if you've even had that espresso and it tasted really good at the cafe or the roaster, you might wanna go get their water and try that at home. Um, because they have a very expensive reverse osmosis system probably, and then they remineralize it and they have it all tweaked to just the right amounts. And you, it's really hard to replicate at home. So if you're really after those flavors, you probably want to get their water and try that. Uh, some good water off the shelf, I think Voltaic is one. I also think that uh, Crystal Geyser is another one that um, has been said that has a pretty good uh, amount of result. Or you get this guy out. Probably the easiest thing to do is uh, third wave water is these little packets one per gallon, you can get yourself a deionized or distilled water, a gallon, pour that in. This is uh, close to SCA specs, which is about what they say that, you know, the right amount of material in there, the right amount of uh, bicarbonate um, and other things, magnesium, that are going to help extract better. So consider water as a possibility. If you really think you got everything right, but it's still not tasting right. Uh, we talked about purging the grinder, make sure that you're pushing out a gram or two of coffee when you make an adjustment before you grind for that next basket because you will be using a couple grams of that last grind or even the last coffee if you're switching in coffees. Um, consistency, repeatability. So you mentioned earlier, I'm more focused on whatever it is I do that I do it again and again and again. So I'm focused more on nice level tamps, good distribution, and doing something that I can replicate. So I like my fingers. I feel like I can really feel in my pads of my fingers how much force I'm using. And that's easier to replicate than, you know, getting in here and putting in my body on the table and all the rest of that, and especially if you're kind of in and out like that. So uh, repeatability, consistency, how much coffee you're, you're putting in, how much coffee you're pulling out, these are the things that are gonna make sure that you get a really good shot, you'll be able to replicate that tomorrow. Resolution on the grinder is really key. I know a lot of people out there um, have not yet invested in their grinder. Uh, I didn't go to see what the poll said. Let me go check real quick while we're here. Uh, first, so, you know, quite a few of you, less than 100, less than 150 bucks. Now, if that's an electric, I can tell you right now, if you spend less than 150 on, a, on an electric, it's probably not ideal for espresso. There's some really good hand grinders you can get just under 150. Um, but just because that grinder, like the Ode is a great example. The Ode from Fellow is supposedly a really great grinder for filter, but it's not good for espresso. In fact, even on the finest setting, you're not going to get fine enough for espresso. Uh, the Encore is another great grinder for filter, but it only has 40 clicks. And so you'll find that say number, I'm just throwing this out, don't hold me to it, but maybe number eight is like the money shot, more or less, but number seven is choking, which is not coming through, and uh, number nine is you know gushing, flowing through too fast. But really, that's it, you're stuck. Number eight's your number, and you can't move off of that. Um, because if you do, it's not gonna be a good result. So the more resolution, the more clicks, the more settings you have, the better you're going to get in there and really like dial in. If you're running out of clicks, then the next step to do is to play with your dose. You can add or, or subtract a little bit of coffee to change the resistance. Also the pressure profile. So what a pressure profile is, if I go straight to nine bar versus slowly ramping into nine bar, that will have a huge effect on the extraction. So say I have a shot that, it, and, and the other reason I like to do that little pre-infusion at the top, I put a one to two, you know, two to three bar maybe max into that coffee bed is I'm watching and feeling the amount of resistance I'm getting. If it's going too fast really quickly, I know I better slam that puck down, hit it with nine to 10 bars probably to try to compress it and slow it down because if I don't, if I slowly ramp to pressure, I'm probably gonna run that shot out really fast. Um, consequently, 
if it's coming through real fast, then I'm probably, the other option is to just not hit it with a lot of force, a lot of uh, pressure, and just keep it down at a six bar shot so that I have more contact time. I can run that shot. It's nice because you can save shots, whereas with a pump machine, you just push that button and it's gonna hit it with nine bars, and whatever happens, happens, and you're stuck with it. Um, with this, you can more, more pressure, less pressure, uh, you can you can modulate and play with that to to hopefully save a shot and not have to toss it out and make another one. Time is another thing. Like I said, if it's running too fast, just slowing that shot down, giving it a little bit more contact time, or running it a little bit longer. So maybe I like to shoot, you know, one to two, two to one. I never remember which ones which because uh, filter coffee they usually go uh, the big number first, small number second, and espresso they sometimes use a small number first. But uh, the point is. I normally would maybe go for, like I said, no more than 32 grams, um, 16 in, 32 out in that case. But if it's running really long, uh, really fast, I'll probably pull some more water through the coffee to try to help to balance and even that shot out. So there's a lot of different ways to mitigate issues as you see them when you have a lever to play with. Uh, so that's a super, uh, super strong point to a manual machine that gives you all the controls that you have. I think I've uh, pretty much gone through most of what I wanted to anyways. Um, I wanted to now open it up. I'm gonna go through the chat real quick and see what you have there. I'm also going to swap out the polls. I have an exit poll, if you would mind uh, doing that one for me as well. Give me some uh, feedback on, on what to do better, um, that sort of thing. And I'm going to go into the chat right now and see what we got here. And uh, altitude considerations for travel. Didn't think about that. Yes, sir, um, definitely about the water temp. So like I said, just boil water. and. A lot of you guys are probably at sea level, but even some of you are probably not boiling at 100. A lot of people are boiling, you know, a few degrees off of that. Some people don't, and don't be surprised if it's, you know, or don't be embarrassed. Some people don't even know what their water boils at, but just boil the water and catch it on the way down. Use a little thermal pen to kind of figure out how long it takes for the temperature to drop again. And then once you know that, I know, you know, a count to 10 or 30 seconds or whatever, usually by a minute, you've already lost quite a bit. Uh, 10, 20, 30 seconds is probably all you ever need to count down as you go to pull the shot just to try to bring it into the range. Um, does anyone know the size of the Flare Pro baskets? I do. It uh, is 46 on the Pro and it's uh, 40 on the Signatures and Classics. You're going to want to ask the guys to do 45.5 for the tamper. If it's too wide, you can get maybe a cleaner tamp, but you also have to make sure it's it's straight up and down because if you turn it just a little bit, it can get kind of jammed in there. 45.5 is a good safe number for uh, tools for this. So that's one thing. Um, and if you have the signature of the classic, 39.25, 39 39.2, something like that is a good number uh, to use for them. Uh, on the subject of tools, I just had a little bit of a rant. You can see now there's a uh, Facebook I've listed at the bottom there some of the places where you can go and get more information and hang out with other people like myself. I'll be there uh, almost every day and uh, get some good feedback and input from people. If you have issues, um, you have, want questions or ask for recommendations on things like grinders, the Brew with Flare group is a good place. Anyways, I just did a little bit of rant last night because a lot of people are, are you know, focused on tools like the levelers and distributors uh, and uh, calibrated tampers and things like that. If you don't know what that is, uh, you'll see it in the group real quick. But really, if you have a good grinder and a $2, you know, this is all this is in case you're curious. Um, these are just 0.4 millimeter thickness needles, acupuncture needles, and a cork. And that's really it. That and the tampers we give you are excellent. And you don't need the rest of the tools. If you're feeling like you need those tools, you probably just need a new grinder. You can't fix grinder issues with tools. Uh, in grinder issues, by that meaning your coffee, when it comes out, there's a lot of powder and a lot of big rocks. There's always going to be a little bit of a mix there, but the better your grinder is, the more aligned it is, uh, the bigger the burrs, generally speaking. You'll find that the grains will all be roughly the same size and it'll be hard to tell them apart, but the worse your grinder is, the more you're gonna find a big range and a lot of powder and a lot of big coarse pieces. There's no fix for that. You'll just need a new grinder. Um, so I'd recommend, making sure your grinder that you have is good enough and, and don't spend any money. You have all the tools you need and you can make them if you wanted to. Um, Weiss distribution, you can do something like a potter's needle or anything like a paper clip is a really cheap, easy way. Paper clip, just kind of move around. So focus on that right now uh, in the meantime. Grinder recommendations, depending on what you're looking for, uh, electric, 
or the Flare or EK43. <laughs> um, I've had the EK43. I have quite a lot of grinders. In fact, I have maybe 10 or 11 manual, maybe more manual grinders and uh, three electrics. And I can tell you that there's a the diminishing returns. Basically, once you get into a decent hand grinder, you're pretty good. And by decent, there's, um, so the Ace 48 is the cheapest thing I've seen on the market that is actually quality and good for espresso, I should say. Ace 48 on Amazon is about 117. Uh, onesie grinder, or onesie presso makes uh, the JX Pro and that's about 160-ish dollars. Of course, the Royal is $180. Then you can go into others like Orphan Espresso Lido. Uh, you can get into some real expensive ones. Uh, Kinu has some for about 200. Uh, the Phoenix is a good one, or the Simplicity. And then you can go into 250 and, and on and on and on, 330 for hand grinders. You'll get more, more bang for your buck with a hand grinder for an electric. The problem there is a lot of that money goes into the motor and the housing and the, all the rest of that, and you're, you're gonna get less for your money. So if you really only have 150, 200 to spend, don't look at electrics, look at hand grinders. It's also nice to grind and, and get the, the sensory that you get from having that wafting underneath your nose. Um, you don't, you know, generally it's zero retention, so you don't have to worry about purging with a hand grinder, so there's a lot of benefits there. Uh, I want a tamper with a bubble level. <laughs> you can pretty much eyeball it and, and get a, that's a good one. Um, you can pretty much eyeball it and see what you got there. Super helpful, awesome. Uh, silicone funnel, so these, uh, again, get on that group. If you're super opposed to Facebook, just make a fake account and just get in there for that reason. I'm, I'm only on Facebook. I'm, I don't do socials, Instagram or Facebook for myself. I'm only there for the coffee and for the business. Uh, so you'll find all these things, the listings, the links. Measure your kettle. So this is a barista. It's the same as a Bonavita. It's about, I think, three inches is what you want. So find one that's three inches uh, around. And if you have a stag uh, kettle, um, from Fellow, it's going to be 3.5. So just find a find anything that is, they usually call it large or wide mouth funnels. Um, and to be safe, buy a set. And then you can just find the one that fits best. Just make sure it's at least wide enough to fit in your kettle. Agreed, I just bought a funnel to try it out. Cool, recommend size of the silicone funnel for the Fellow EKG, I gave it to you, 4.5. I've also used paper clips. Sweet, does that texture tool you used also heat the milk. No, um, this is only going to texture and the way to heat it, you know, this is again, most, most jugs that you get, you can't, it's just a thin piece of metal or some don't even have a handle at all. And so if I put this on a stove, this will heat up, but it would also heat up this and I wouldn't be able to hold it. So this kettle that it comes with, this jug that it comes with as a set, if you buy it that way, you could put this on a stove, um, low heat, and just kind of keep it moving. While you go, I had a little, I had it heated before I went, and then I have, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's enough to just a cup warmer. It's not gonna actually get it to temperature, but you can get small little uh, hot pads for that. And that's how you do that. Or you can put it in glass and microwave it for about 35, 45 seconds. You'll figure out what works for you. And then you can heat the milk quickly in the microwave and then use that. Uh, French press is another option for that. All right, so I want, I want to see if you guys have any other questions uh, that want to come up. You're welcome to unmute. Ask me now. You've got me. Um, so if you have any questions. Yeah, a few questions. Yep. So when you're doing the tamper, um, obviously you want it level. But what if when you put the, uh, the little filter piece on top and you feel it unlevel, should I push it down with that filter or just take it out and re-tamper again? It depends on how bad you found that like uh, in there. Chances are if it's dropped in, it's probably stuck and me pushing on it is only gonna dig in the low edge and kind of scoop up into the coffee bed. So at that point, I would you know try to get that back out, hit it into something where you can get the coffee bag. It used to be sacrilege to have to retamp to like, if you didn't like your tamp, to dump it out and then put it back in. They used to say, oh, you gotta start all over and run coffee and that's all bogus. Uh, the coffee grounds are not going to be affected by the, the force. They're just going to redistribute. So at that point, if it's, if it's jammed in there, I would say get it out, start over. Um, but if you use it, honestly, I have like 99.9% .9 success rate by just sliding this over the top and letting it drop right in. It just drops straight in. If you sit there and try to like drop it from a height, it almost always doesn't work out. It, well, that did, but it almost always kind of get caught there. So just slide it over the top and let it fall in. Don't try to drop it in. Uh, anybody else for that? As far as, um, yep. as far as dialing in new coffee beans um, that you've never tried, 
I see that you have the Royal Grinder. What settings, what range of settings are you um, dialing in for? All right, I'm not going to be... I'm not being mean when I say it this way. You have to do the work. You can't ask for numbers. I see that happening all the time in the group. People are like, I've got the Comandante, you got the Comandante, what number? If I use little bit, or if I use more or less coffee than you use, if I use a lighter roast, then use a darker roast. If I use a different tamp pressure than you do, if I use a different pressure profile than you do, all these things change, and especially on grinders where you only have, you know, um, where you have a lot, of, a lot of adjustment to play with. It, it, the numbers don't translate so well, and from grinder to grinder, um, so we put numbers on our grinder, and sometimes I wonder if that was a mistake because people want to use numbers, and if we didn't use numbers, you'd have clicks. And so Comandante is one of those that just uses clicks. Uh, Orphan Espresso doesn't use any anything but ticks as well. And the reason they do that is because everybody's grinder is going to zero out in a different place. So on the flare, you might zero out. When I say zero out, I should say, Burr lockup. So if you go all the way in the uh, counterclockwise position to the point where the burrs lock and you can't move the, the handle, that's a uh, soft burr lockup. And that's, you know, basically your burrs are touching, kissing. Uh, you can't grind there. You got to back it off somewhere. And, and usually you have to go, I would say, wherever your burrs touch, go a complete revolution from that number. So if my burrs touch at eight, then I would go all the way to eight and play in that, in that area for my first few times. Um, on the Comandantes, it's like number 10 if you don't have red clicks, it's number 20 if you do have red clicks, uh, but roughly, and these things will change based on your grinder because two grinders are gonna be a little bit different even if they're the same brand. Uh, and then again, all those other variables. So what I like to say is try to find the grind that works for your dose, your tamp, your pressure, all of that, and gets you somewhere in the 35 second shot range at about six to eight bars. If you can get there, it will probably be a, a good tasting shot and you'll be wanting to, to dial it in and get a little bit more into it, but you won't have to throw that one out. Um, when it comes to the grind, and, and that's the other thing I talked about, the, the different grinders will have uh, a different output. So if your grinder is, is making very precise cuts, you're going to, they're gonna feel and look a little bit different in your fingers than a grinder that's putting out a much wider uh, spread of small and, and coarse. So it's a little bit hard, but I would suggest going for something like uh, the grain, uh, like a sort of a coarse sand, um, or maybe like a brown sugar. You want it to feel a little soft in your fingers, but not too powdery, and you also don't want it to be too coarse. Uh, but I'm sorry, I can't give you a number, and it's it's kind of my, my uh, little pet peeve, because it, you, just have to, you just have to experiment. Coffee is so different. I've had coffees, that I will have to go, I don't know, maybe 10 clicks finer just to extract than the last one. So if I was using that coffee and you asked me to my number, it would be completely useless to you. Um, so it, it's not just the, the style of pulling the shot and the tamp and all the rest. The coffee will have a huge, how fresh the coffee is, how, how you know. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that one. Get coffee that has dates of roasted dates, not best by dates. If it's a best by date, it could tell you it's good for a year. But honestly, it's good for three to four months at the most. If you're looking for crema and you're doing everything right and you don't get crema, it's because your coffee no longer has the CO2. The CO2 is what's gonna create those bubbles for you. So try to use coffee within the first 30 to 45 days. The, the window of uh, fre peak freshness and flavors and aroma and everything else, somewhere between seven and 21 days. But once you get outside of uh, 30, 45 days, don't expect much in the way of crema. All right, anybody else with questions? Anybody, anybody? If not, we can wrap it up. But I'll give you another chance how to catch me. I think Victoria, you just joined us. I'm sorry, uh, you must've caught the wrong time zone. Uh, I will have this as a recording for you, like I said, and you'll be able to uh, get that and watch it later and you wouldn't miss anything. So sorry about that. My French press has, let me just look real quick here, then we'll get you. My French press has worked for me for frothing all my milk, so how can I make sure that I don't over froth too many bubbles? Um, I would say you just have to figure that out with the milk that you're using and the French press and all the rest. What I like to do is I like to do, uh, in the beginning, you're, you're trying to aerate the milk, so I would do rapidly, and I'd keep the plunger at the top of the milk, the, the first top two thirds or a third of the milk, just trying to aerate it for about maybe 30 plunges, quick plunges, and then, I will slow it down a little bit and I'll go through the entire uh, length 
of that column in a French press and I'm just trying to you know, get those bubbles all the way through and hopefully kind of flatten some of them out. But uh, I'm, I've, I've had varying success with the French press. Um, so I'm happy to have something else that's a little bit easier for when you don't have a steam. I have uh, steam ones. So there's a Bellman. If you want to get a stove top steamer, the Bellman, uh, it goes by different names, but you can go on to Amazon, uh, but also eBay and you can buy a, you know, eBay, uh, Bellman's been around for many, many years, decades. So there's a lot of secondhand Bellman's on the market. Um, so just type in CX-25 stovetop steamer, CX-25 or CXE-25 for the electric version. Um, and you can get uh, different looks. Some of them are, they call them like coffee makers. You can just not use the coffee part. Those are the ones that are most common out there. And uh, there's a CX-50, I think, 50SS for the just the steamer thing. Uh, so that's another thing if you want to use a stovetop steamer. I believe they work well on most induction. Uh, gas or electric. Um, so that's another way to do it. All right. Did you have another question? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, it's saying that you're doing back-to-back -back, uh, espressos. Um, like, should I be really worried about the brew head temperature getting too low? Or do you think that just by brewing an espresso, it's mm -hmm. preheated enough? Uh, not sure how important it is to like maintain a certain degree of like temperature for the head. It's very important if you want the same flavors and taste. Um, it depends on how fast you're, you're able to move through, if you can do it in a matter of seconds as opposed to a minute or whatever. Um, and again, depending on um, how well you did the preheat. So if I came in and, and, and had this, some people will put this in the bottom of a pot of water or the bottom of their kettle to make sure that this is really the same temperature, uh, depending on how far you want to take it. That's that or if you have a mocha, people will put it in the uh, bottom part of the mocha and let it steam. And those are like the ways to get it like absolutely as hot as you can. If you're quick about it or say you had a second one of these ready to go and literally all you're doing is removing this, resetting that and putting it back down on this, you probably can get away without a preheat um, and just keep going. Now, if I obviously spent a lot of time between the two and uh, even if it were just to take me a minute, minute and a half, I'd probably want to pull this off, stick it back on the steam or the, the whatever it was I was preheating it for 30 seconds a minute at the most, and then go again. Not a big deal. Um, but that's, it's trial and error. It depends on what you're brewing. The darker your roast is, the less focused you have to be on temperature. In fact, darker roast, like as in getting to the point where you start to see oil on the beans, you don't want to come in with as much heat as you can. You don't want that to be at the, the upper ranges because it will actually extract things you don't like out of the coffee. So with a darker roast, you can, you can be a little bit more um, uh, lazy about, about the preheat and about you know, going between one or the other. Uh, but again, I'd, I'd say probably the best is to get a second basket or at least just have all the coffee ground and ready to go so you can just quickly move through it. Um, uh, old beans for training and practice. Absolutely, it's a very good point. I'm sorry I didn't bring it up. If you just got your flare, uh, and you're just trying to figure out like where to even be on your grinder and all the rest, or you get a new grinder and you need to dial in the grinder for the flare. Um, you should use like cheap Pete's coffee is probably my best, my best uh, like store bought. You can get those almost always something from Pete's is on sale for like six bucks, uh, six fifty or whatever. And Pete's not terrible, you know, as far as like the big the big brands go. Um, stay away from Starbucks. They won't even tell you when they roast it. Pete's tells you when they roast it, so you can literally find a bag within the first 30 to 45 days from Pete's, um, so it's drinkable. They also have, um, I would say, more in the medium and light roast options than Starbucks does, but they're honest about when they roasted it, and you can almost always get those for like six bucks, something there, so that'd be a good way to do it. And that at least gets you feeling, you know, your grinder. Like I said, I, I could go to your house if you had the same grinder as mine, and, and I could, even though our numbers are gonna be different, I could feel the grind and figure out where I need to be on your grinder because I know what the, the burrs are going to put out there. But if you have a completely different grinder than me, I'm gonna have a harder time. Um, you know, that the biggest wake up was when I first got the EK43. I thought I knew what I needed and then I, I ground it for the EK43. For those that don't notice, it's like a ridiculously expensive, almost three grand uh, grinder. But it's so, the burrs are huge and so the, the cuts are clean and and you're gonna be able to grind a lot finer on that one because all the grinds will be closer to your target and you'll get less of the powder. Whereas on a cheaper grinder, you're gonna have to go a lot coarser in on average because you're going to get a lot of fines that are gonna choke and cause issues with the extraction. Oh, speaking of uh, that, should have mentioned that too. 
The reason I use a mirror is I like to watch to see what's going on. If I see it really dark here and really light here, it means all the water's passing through that lighter section a lot faster than it's moving through the rest of the coffee. So I'm only extracting really half my, my coffee bed. I'm not really extracting this side. So the flavors are never gonna be that good, um, even if the time and everything else works out perfectly. So I don't always use a mirror, but I kinda like to anyways, even though I don't feel like I need to. I just I enjoy that view. But definitely when you're first dialing in, trying to get your distribution right, trying to figure out how good your grinder really is and your technique, make sure you get a mirror just for watching to see where your extraction is. It almost always starts out here. Um, don't be deterred if it starts out here but fills in really quick, that's good. If it only ends up staying there and you never really fill in the middle, that means you probably ground too fine, so you need to coarsen that grind a little bit. Uh, maybe back off on your temp a little bit if you don't have your temp, if you don't have some um, range to work with on your grinder. But you wanna see a nice even color extraction and you wanna see it fill in pretty quickly in the middle. If that's not happening, then you got, a, you got some issues to deal with. Um, all right. I have the signature and haven't been able to get a clean puck out when I'm finished. Espresso is good so far. Well, that's all that matters in my book if the espresso tastes good, but it has been tough, clean. All right, so I got some tips. So there's three or four of you with a uh, signature. First off, easiest thing is if you have the signature, looks kind of gross, and if you're making it for somebody else, I don't advise, but if you blow real hard and fast, you can push that puck right out. Um, that's the easiest thing. The more hygienic way is, I made this with a turkey baster, and I took my spout, which I never use anyways, and I glued that on, push it back, and then you can shoot it out. So that's the absolute best way, most hygienic way to do it. Um, that assumes you don't need the spout, which you might if you have a bad grinder and you're getting sprays and channeling everywhere. Speaking of sprays and channeling, again, it's back to what I just mentioned with extraction. If, um, if it's coming through faster through here and less through here, you're going to have velocity uh, differences, and that's where you get these jets. So if you're dealing with jets all the time, messing up your counter, a couple things you can do. Coarsen your grind a little bit, assuming you're, you're in the right time frame um, already. You can coarsen your grind to help the water kind of move through better it's, um, through the whole puck. Use less pressure. You don't need to make espresso at nine bar. If you start at six bar, you tend to have less of these sprays because it's a little bit gentler and even. Um, and also possibly drop your dose a little bit. And so the channeling, when the water's coming faster through certain parts, those are the things that are creating the spray. Anytime you water your garden on a hose and you stuck your thumb over and you see the jets coming out, you're creating velocity dif differences and you're partially obstructing that hole, that's why you get these issues. Uh, so I think that answers your question about the signature. Uh, should I purposely be, purposely be making bad shots to taste bad shots? I have a better idea for you, um, to taste bad shots. Better idea is to do where you basically have to have somebody helping you because it's a manual machine, you're gonna be preoccupied pulling the shot. But if you're, you know, I can do it by myself and you can do it too. Have four cups lined up on the table. Start pulling the shot here, and then, well, you probably want another person because you do want the other, you want someone to do this at the same time, so it's kind of hard, but um, swap out cups. Do that four times in the course of one shot, and you'll see how differently your espresso is going to taste the first 10 grams to the next 10 grams, and on and on and on, um, or seven grams, whatever you want to swap it out. Get about four different cups involved so you can kind of taste it out. You're not going to like the first one. It's going to be so like strong, um, probably tastes a little bit sour, uh, just really intense. The last one's gonna taste watery and uh, some of the worst parts of the espresso and the, you're gonna like somewhere in between those first two shots. It's another way to kind of get a feeling for um, the differences in espresso, so whether it's more sour, acid, whether it's more bitter, acrid, this kind of thing at the other end. Um, you could, but I think you're going to have enough opportunity to have bad shots on accident that you don't need to experiment. You'll figure it out here soon. But that's a good test to kind of figure out where you like, and that helps you to decide, do I like a one to two or a one to three? Do I like a longer shot, a shorter shot? Sometimes the coffees dictate. If I do a lighter roast, I will usually run that a little bit, little bit more water through the puck. So I'll typically, um, you know, three times the amount of dry coffee is how much espresso I want to have. Whereas if it's medium or darker roast, I want to pull that a little bit shorter. So that's another thing to mention about brew ratios. All right, I think I got all the questions in chat. Are there, are there any other questions before we say goodbye? And uh, yeah, so thank you for joining us here. I uh, appreciate you picking up the flare again. I appreciate you spending some time with us today and you know taking that kind of 
uh, effort and um, interest in getting better shots, that kind of thing. If you ever need to reach out to us, service at Flare Espresso, Facebook group, Instagram, these are all good places to reach. Uh, usually it's the same people and all those were, you know, the customer outreach. So uh, thanks for joining us and yeah, look, to, look forward to seeing you in the Brew with Flare group, guys. Have a good one.